Good morning. It's still morning. Thank goodness. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Jack Wilson. I'm a member of the faculty of the Studio Art Department here at Dartmouth and an architect. I'm really pleased to welcome you all here today for this uh, program. It's been a while in the making. I, I want to acknowledge um, the supreme efforts of Kathy Lambert, who is not here with us today. She's traveling and, and was unable to attend. But um, Kathy and I started working on this about a little over a year ago. And um, she's been an inspiration to work with. I'd also like to call out uh, Susan Thorne in the audience. Susan, can you stand up? Is Susan here? Well, I'm serving as MC today, and Susan is my backup. So if you have any messages or anything that you need to deliver to the podium, please try to work through Susan or myself. Um, so as a teacher, um, I find a lot of inspiration in my students, and I find that teaching and learning are really the same thing. Um, you never stop learning, and the students are sometimes the best teachers. Um, so I'm really pleased to have this event come together here at Dartmouth to marry the efforts of teachers, students, and practitioners in the fields of design. And uh, I'm really, really thrilled to have you all here. My job initially here is to thank all of our sponsors for the program, so I'll do that now. And uh, we have uh, really a wonderful lead sponsorship uh, for this event that was provided to Dartmouth College by Dr. Mary Morgan Finnegan, uh, Dartmouth class of 1986. Um, her generosity has provided not only the funding, uh, major funding for this event, but uh, for other events associated with the initiatives and sustainability around campus. So we're very, very pleased and uh, grateful to Dr. Finnegan. Uh, the George Link Jr. Environmental Awareness Lecture, David Orr's keynote speak, speech tonight, is uh, sponsored by the Dartmouth College Environmental Studies Program. And Andy Friedland, uh, the chair, is a participant in the program, too. Our platinum sponsors include uh, the Newcomb Institute for Computational Science at Dartmouth. Uh, Dr. Hanny Fareed is the director of that program and Public, Ser Public Service of New Hampshire, a six-time IDID sponsor, and Kate Hartnett will be speaking about uh, IDID sponsorship soon. Uh, and Randy Dixon is here with us, I believe. Uh, for gold sponsors, we have Low and Windows Center of Vermont and New Hampshire. Steve Carey is here from Low and Windows. Uh, our silver sponsors are Bond uh, with David Andronico, Jesse St Starnino, and John Vukic here. Uh, Second Wind Water Systems Incorporated, Chris Saltmarsh and uh, Charlie Samardulis. Samardulis, thank you, uh, are here. And Wright Ryan Construction, uh, John Ryan and Cordelia Pittman. Uh, bronze sponsors, <clears throat> the Leslie Center for Humanities at Dartmouth College, uh, Executive Director Anya Donovan. A.W. Hastings, Marvin and Integrity Windows and Doors, uh, Joe Orsino. Bruss Construction Incorporated, Michael Bruss and Pete Voris. Copeland Furniture Company Store, Bradford, Vermont, Abby Copeland. Daniel O'Connell Sons, Dick Hansen and Steve Pelletier. Engelberth Construction, Timothy Vadney. IBEA, Integrated Building Energy Associates, LLC, Michael Bruss and Pete Voris. Macmillan Company, Ted Schrantz and Steve LaJoy. North Branch Construction, Ken Brown. And then we have friends of IDID. Atelier Renewables, the Ethics Institute at Dartmouth College, Building Energy Technologies, Peterson Engineering, James Peterson, PE, Plan New Hampshire, Robin LeBlanc, and Trumbull Nelson Construction Company, Dave Harrison, right here in Hanover, New Hampshire. So my next task is to introduce Linda Snyder. Linda is the Vice President of Campus Planning and Facilities at Dartmouth. She came to Dartmouth from Harvard in the summer of 2009, where she served as Associate Executive Dean of Physical Resources and Planning for the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Prior to her work at Harvard, Linda was Executive Director of the Massachusetts State College Building Authority. She's a landscape architect and received a degree in landscape architecture and in environmental planning from Utah State University, and was a John L. Loeb Fellow in 1996 uh, to 1997 at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. I'm really pleased to have Linda come up now and uh, introduce the conference in general and uh, take it from there. Thank you very much for being here. You know, for a, a woman new to Dartmouth, this is a little bit overwhelming. <laughs> I'm 
Very grateful to be here to welcome all of you to Dartmouth College. Even on a rainy day, I think one of the preeminent and most beautiful colleges in the United States. Um, I'm especially grateful for the partnership of the Environmental Guild of the New Hampshire AIA in sponsoring this conference with the Dartmouth Sustainability Initiative and Dartmouth College. Uh, my job today, other than to say hello to you all and greet you, is to really provide a very short in introduction uh, and then to introduce Kate Hartnett, who she just described to herself to me as the chief instigator of IDID, which is a great title. I, I want chief instigator <laughs> on my next, my next uh, business card. Uh, we have a very, very interesting program for you today. We'll have a plenary talk by Dana Baumeister, The Lotus and the Peacock, Biomimicry as a Path to Sustainability. We have two excellent panels, Zero Net Energy, Part 1, Theory and Practice, and Part 2, Energy Innovations at Dartmouth College. And I want to tell you that I spend a whole bunch of my time with the energy innovators at Dartmouth College, and they're terrific, and I'm very proud to be their colleague. The second panel will be Emerging Practices in Sustainable Landscapes and Living Buildings, and then the day will conclude with a keynote address by David Orr, Design and Applied Hope, Building Durable and Decent Communities. And David will be introduced by Dean of the Faculty, Carol Folt, Dean of the Faculty and Acting Provost, Carol Folt, who's one of my favorite people here at Dartmouth. Just to touch very briefly on some of our themes, and I, what I'd like to do is touch the theme and then tell you a little bit about my perspective and how I connect to that theme. One of our themes is to discuss and understand the global imperative for sustainable de design initiatives as landscapes and planners. And I know in my bones that the sustainable landscape is the only kind of landscape that survives that we can build. Um, the campus landscape is one of the most interesting landscapes in the United States because as a large Land, large land area owned by a single entity, we have opportunities in higher education and in medicine and other, other campus owners to really model and demonstrate the sustainable landscape. And I, I hope that we, I know Dartmouth has done that greatly in the past. You can be amazed at some of our elms and our, we also have a ways to go in our stormwater management and um, a number of our landscape elements. We, uh, we will talk about the integration of sustainable design practices into every project. So we take the large scale to the project. And we know here that renewal of our buildings is our most important challenge in the next few years. We don't, Dartmouth has grown by 33% of its, 35% in its square footage in the decade that we've just been through. We now need to turn our eyes much more uh, in a much more dedicated and disciplined way to renewal of the great buildings at Dartmouth College. We want to showcase advances towards zero net energy and meet Steve Shadford and some of our great engineers. We want to highlight lessons from nature and we want to challenge ourselves to bring all of these ideas that we talk about today and tomorrow into our daily practices. So the most important job I have is to introduce Kate Hartnett. Uh, Kate is a geographer who works on reducing ecological footprint of the built environment. She has 40 years of experience in the private, government, and nonprofit sectors, half of those in New Hampshire. In 1998, Kate founded the Jordan Institute, a nonprofit center for efficient land use and energy practices. Kate works at many scales, again, perfect for the campus environment, at the site, community, and landscape scale to incorporate in integrated design and development. Kate lives part-time in Deerfield, where she serves on many public boards, and part-time in Berlin, New Hampshire, where she renovated a 1910 home, reducing her energy use by 60%. She participates in design. Uh, she uh, is a founding member of the Seven Town Bear Paw Regional Greenway. Kate has a BA from Bryn Mawr. She majored in growth and structure of cities and an MA in resource geography from Columbia University. She has many awards, and I'm afraid that my, I can maybe do it in my one minute signal. Kate is the Leadership New Hampshire Class of 1999, a ballot and network Club of Rome limits to growth in 2002, New Hampshire Public Health Association Roger Fossum Lifetime Achievement in 2007, National American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine President's Award in 2008, Center for Whole Communities Vermont Fellowship Retreat Award in 2008. 
and the American Institute of Architects New Hampshire chapter honorary member in 2009. Welcome, Kate. Thank you very much. So hello, everybody. I don't look as old as that sounded, do I? <laughs> I hope not. I'm just going to take a couple minutes. I actually want to beat my time schedule so we can get Dana up here to speak to you. She's come a very long way, Dana Baumeister. But I just wanted to take two minutes to talk about integrated design, integrated development. I wanted to talk about who's in the room, why we're here. And don't worry, this is an open book quiz, but we did have homework, which I want to touch on. Now, hopefully you all know what I'm talking about with the homework. And then I'm going to introduce our timekeeper and our chime man. So let me do that quickly. This book came out in 1998. It was called uh, For Our Future, Guide to Caring for New Hampshire's Environment. It's some work that I did early on. Out of that, surprise, we figured out we had to work on changing our energy use and our land use to maintain the quality of life we've all come to appreciate. Starting in 2003, Integrated Design, Integrated Development, there's been a series of six conferences on those topics. Uh, the mission really is to illustrate the value and techniques for a multidisciplinary design process that produces efficient, cost-effective, and delightful buildings, grounds, communities, and landscapes. Now, who can argue with that, right? So that's what we're up to. And the way we're doing that is, what we're going to hear more about today, is protecting and making use of the ecological services of the system around us. Our goals are to increase the capacity and the demand for such things. Um, in terms of who's here, this is an interesting mix. Thank you for pre-registering. The numbers I see, about half of us are architects and students. About 30% are people like building contractors, faculty, staff, engineers, educators, landscape architects. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and then the other 20% are a full range of other categories that you're too much to mention. But it's a great mix of people, and that's all part of this integrated design concept. Buildings and grounds, architects, engineers, people who operate them, it's all part of the mix. And in terms of the expectations, about half the people, when they signed in, answered what they thought were the top two to three issues. One person was honest and said, I don't know. Please inform me. Everybody else had opinions, which is great. Um, so that actually fits really nicely with the title and the themes that Linda touched on. The global imperative for more sustainable design. I'll just w use one number to answer that, which is 350. And it's in uh, your participant book to learn more about that if you don't. The second, thing, second theme advances toward zero net energy and retrofits. That number is 2030, 2030 challenge. Lessons from biology and the importance of regenerative design, that's our third theme. That's in our definitions in the participant book and also what we're going to hear from Dana and others today. And then finally for all of us, the fourth theme, the benefits and challenges of moving from lead to living buildings. That's the work of all of us here because we live in one system, one planetary system, What's exciting about this conference is over the six, we've really tipped, I think, much more toward the positive and the possible and the hopeful. And I hope that by the time we leave here today and then the applied work tomorrow, we're all energized to move toward the theme of the conference. Uh, unfortunately, my cartoon is gone. But in your participant book, Boiling it all down is a cartoon that says the climate summit. What if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? And I'd say, let's just go for it. Energy independence, preserving things, sustainability, green jobs, livable cities, renewables, clean air, water, healthy children, healthy reefs. It's all part of this big system we're going to learn about today. So if you haven't done your homework, there's still time. It's still on the website. Do your carbon footprint. Read the definitions. Read the quote from Bill Gates about the need and why this is happening and getting into the mainstream. And thank you very much for joining us.
So I'm going to move right on. Uh, let me introduce, you'll see him a lot today, Wes Tater, the man with the signs. Just stand up for a second, Wes. Thank you. He's the timekeeper. And Bert, you've already seen, the man with the chimes. He will keep us attentive and on schedule. It's sort of an id, ID thing we do, which is calm but moving forward. So thank you all very much for that. And let me move right on to introducing Dana. Let me see about time here. Actually, I have a couple minutes. I want to do one more thing. I would like members of the IDID and Environmental Guild to stand up, please, if you don't mind. You know who you are. Just stand up for a minute. There's Susan. We were looking for you earlier. Thank you. Other folks, so just take a look at these folks. If you run into them, ask them some about what we're up to. That would be wonderful uh, to learn more about this last six conferences. And also folks who worked on the Sustainable Design Symposium, could you just stand up? Uh, I want to thank you for your efforts. Jack, is Marissa here or Serene or others? Out oh, still working, okay, but we'll find them. And then lastly, I'd ask people to stand who have been to a previous Integrated Design, Integrated Development Conference. Excellent. So we typically are only about 100, and this is over 200 today, so we've got a lot of new people in the room. Thank you all very much. All right, on to Dana. There you are. Hello. So there's a long bio here, and I'm not going to read it all. But I am going to say that my understanding of Dana is that you have a background in biology, a devotion to applied natural history, and a passion for sharing the wonders in, of nature with others. And you've worked in the field of biomimicry since 1998 as an educator, researcher, and design consultant. And you began your early work doesn't say where, but I do know that you ended up in Florida for a while, undergraduate, marine biology at the New College in Sarasota. And then for some reason, you left behind the coral reefs, turned in your wetsuit, and headed to the mountains. Uh, master's and MS in resource conservation, and then a PhD in organismic biology and ecology from the University of Montana in Missoula specializing in the dynamics of positive interactions among animals and plant life. Imagine, positive interactions. And that in addition to traveling many places and working very hard, you find spiritual and physical sustenance as a gardener, hunter, yoga instructor, and naturalist, and you live with your family in the foothills of the inspiring landscape of the Front Range in Montana, Rocky Mountains. Is that you? Well, come on up and join us. Thank you very much. Thank you all. It's a long way from Montana to New Hampshire, <laughs> let me tell you. Uh, from one little, small, absolutely gorgeous mountain town to another small, gorgeous mountain town. Um, still in one country, but it takes about 10 hours um, on, and a lot of airports and a lot of sort of zoning in and out of this uh, huge planet and getting a good look at what it means for us as a species living here. All you have to do is look out the window and see that we are one of the most dominant species on this planet for many reasons. So this is my son, and um, he's nine. And being the son of two PhD biologists, when he asks the question about nature, he doesn't get a very simple answer, <laughs> as you might imagine. We uh, go into quite a bit of length and detail and understanding of, of what might be happening. And the other day, he was asking me, why is it, Mama, that all of the animals, when they fly, their wings move up and down? But when we fly in our airplanes, they're fixed airplanes. Great question, right? Really, really great question. So of course, I couldn't just you know, give the sort of biomechanical response. I had to start with 4.5 billion years ago. <laughs> and that's actually the age of our planet. 
all right? And also pretty close to the age of the universe, uh, in which, or at least our solar system. And four and a half billion years is actually a really long time. We sort of toss around those words uh, a lot, especially when we're talking about um, trillions of dollars of de deficits, right? Billion doesn't actually sound like very much. But if we take four and a half billion years and compress that into one year, so that January 1st, the Earth is born, and December 31st is where we stand today, just a breath before midnight. So that's four and a half billion years. Well, in that time, life has come to evolve on this planet. And about 3.85 billion years ago is when life showed up, and that would actually be around March 1st. So the first two months, January, February, was the whole primordial soup thing happening. Of course, my son's nodding his head. What does this have to do with dragonflies, Mom? But <laughs> the primordial soup, and then we have organisms showing up on March 1st. March 28th is when photosynthesis evolves. So about a month of just that original chemical uh, energy going on. And then all of April and May and June and July and August, we just have single-celled organisms just single cells. You have to wait all the way till September 1st for sex to happen, right? So two, two organisms, two individuals, and you get multicellular organisms starting to happen. And then very quickly, we have land plants, and we have fish, and we have amphibians, and reptiles, the dinosaurs, dominated the planet for almost 350 million years. And they went extinct a really long time ago, right? Christmas day in the afternoon, about 4 o'clock in the afternoon is when that asteroid hit. So just six days ago is when the dinosaurs went extinct. Fast forward a little bit further, and our species, Homo sapiens sapiens, right, descended from hominids, two-legged. Our two-legged ancestors have only been on the planet a little more than five hours, and Homo sapiens sapiens has been here less than five minutes. And the entire Industrial Revolution, which defines life as we know it, gives us these buildings, shows us all the models and the ways for which we live on this planet, doesn't even qualify for one second in the Earth. But in that time, of course, life has evolved all these amazing, incredible adaptations. The lotus, symbol of incredible purity growing up from a really mucky, dirty swamp, right, out of the bottom of the muck, but yet we consider it one of the most sacred plants there are. They, they have sprouted a 5,000-year-old lotus seed. Think of sort of the resilience in that sort of model. Or the peacock, I mean, with the, with the incredible brilliance and color that we all, every child, every adult, met just is completely is amazed by. But the only pigment that exists in a peacock is melanin, brown. All of those rest of those fabulous colors are created with a play of light, which is why a peacock feather is always brilliant, no matter how long it's been off of that peacock, because it's structural color. Those are just a few of the amazing, amazing things that life has evolved on this incredible place we call home, our planet Earth. And there's a couple of things that we know that are true about this planet. The number one operating condition, which as biologists we're trained and we're all pretty aware of, is that life must have water, right? And, and it turns out that Earth is a water-based planet, and hence one of the reasons why we have life here on this planet. And when we go to other planets and we look through the stars, what we're looking for is water, because if we find water, there might be life. So it's the number one operating condition of this planet. It's the number one condition that allows all of us and all of the other species to be here, right? But you'd never know that water was so incredibly sacred when you look at the way that we treat it. If aliens sort of flew over our planet and were observing our behavior, they'd be like, oh, they have this weird toxic thing called water that they don't treat very well, right? They don't see it. We don't see it as sacred. It's an important part of our planet. Another thing that's true of our planet is that, well, it's subjected to the laws of conservation of energy and matter, right? There are limits and boundaries, right? While we may have a whole bunch of sun pouring into our content, or our planet, everything else is kind of fixed. And I think this picture is a pretty powerful one. In the 70s, we're coming up on Earth Day here pretty soon, 
when those first pictures of the Earth showed up from space, that is one of the galvanizing moments of our sort of passion for the environment when we saw that little blue gem floating in a very black sea. To me, these pictures are almost as powerful. They're models, computer models. On the left there, that little blue marble, that's all of the water on the planet. Volume ratios, right? That little blue marble represents all of the fresh water, all of the salt water, all of the frozen water, all of the water droplets in the interstitial spaces between grains of sand. That's it. It's a pretty powerful limit that we have to work with. The other one on the right, that white marble represents our atmosphere. Right? That's it. That's the whole atmosphere in which we pump our gases, in which we breathe our oxygen, in which we exhale our carbon dioxide. So it's just a good reminder, while we like to think of ourselves as super human, we are still subjected to the laws of physics, and uh, we cannot deny that some of these things are true of our planet. Another thing that's been true for the last four and a half billion years is that this, the Earth is in a state of dynamic non-equilibrium. Sounds like a pretty complicated term, but really what it says is that things change. And the way I like to think about it is a bowl. And if we had equilibrium, there would be a spot in that bottom of the bowl where things would settle. Right? That's what we think if you throw a marble in or strawberry, whatever, it'll settle in the bottom of that bowl. But the challenge is, is that that bowl is always moving. Right? It's a constantly shifting bowl. So that's the dynamic part. And because it's always moving, it's non-equilibrium. Right? But yet we, especially in the built environment, like to think that we're not subjected to that shifting. And as a matter of fact, if we hold really hard, we can hold that bowl still, or so we think. Right? We can control our interior climates so that they are a consistent 67 degrees, independent of the outside temperature. Of course, we know we have to pump a lot of energy into the buildings in order to achieve that. And then every once in a while, um, the Earth sort of wakes up and says, you know what, you really can't hold us still. Pff, Katrina, Pff, earthquake, right? Or climate change or whatever it might be, it's a good reminder that, that while we think of ourselves as being pretty incredible species, and we are, we really can't hold that bowl still. So what life has done in the last 3.85 billion years is learn to design itself round. Right? So it doesn't matter where the equilibria is. It can roll to that place of balance. For that moment in time, it will be in balance. So it's about flow. There's a lot of other things that life has learned to do in the last 3.85 billion years. There's an incredible amount of time-tested wisdom. Because we as a species are asking ourselves, how should we live here? How do we do this? And a lot of us are starting to think, well, we can just sort of come up with it on our own, and if we talk amongst ourselves and share one brain idea to another brain idea, while well, forgetting the incredible wisdom of the last 10 months of the year of this planet that have sort of figured out some of these things for us. In fact, right now on this planet, there are about 30 million other species. And some estimates go up to 100 million other species. And this represents less than 1% of all the species that have ever lived on the planet. So we're looking at the success stories. They're there. They're right out our door. And in this time, this time-tested wisdom has demonstrated the ability to be locally reliant right? on what sun, what water, what soil is there, and to build incredibly resilient, strong, robust systems in place. Life has learned to live well with very precious resources. This is an Australian mullock, and it can actually wick water out of damp sand, enough water to drink out of, by just putting its belly in the sand and wicking that water. Life has learned to create shelter as needed. Right? I need a cocoon now. I'm going through a sort of metamorphosis kind of thing. I need some protection, and not necessarily permanent structures that last forever. Life has learned to adapt to place. Well, when we see an organism, that organism is a product of its context. All right? It's not the same McDonald's in Alaska as it is in Florida. It is adapted to those local places. 
Life has learned to protect from the elements, all sorts of ways, protect from sun and water and wind and temperature variation. And in doing so, has built incredibly strong and lightweight materials, using the minimal amount of energy to assemble them and using what we call a safe subset of the periodic table. Right? What is abundant and building those building blocks to build incredible materials. Doing it in a way that's benignly manufactured. The spider silk that a spider produces is stronger than steel, ounce for ounce. But yet it's flexible, it's resilient, it's manufactured in the belly, in the abdomen of a spider. Right? It's not a big, intensive, heat-beaten treat where you have to wear you know, furnace and gloves and you're blinded by the melting of steel. And it's made from chopped up fly parts. Right? And it's better than Kevlar. So benignly manufacturing while caring for future generations. Right? Not just meeting immediate needs, but also recognizing in order to protect the home of my future generations, I need to protect the homes that we have now. And in doing so, structure is not just there to support the individual, but structure provides habitat. It enhances place. This is a mangrove crop root system of a red mangrove. Incredibly important. Like 90% of our commercial fisheries, those fish spend some part of their life in a mangrove ecosystem. But yet, those prop roots are there for the mangrove. And it doesn't do it in isolation. Organisms get involved in all sorts of interrelationships. These are leaf cutter ants. They're involved in a five kingdom interrelationship. They have a five different kingdoms, bacteria and virus and fungi and plants and animals are all associated together if you call viruses a kingdom. Right? Connecting in these interrelationships, they're harvesting the leaves to grow the fungi which they eat, and the fungi have a bacteria that kills off the fungi, so they infect that fungi with a virus from their bellies to prevent it from getting eaten by the bacteria. Incredibly interconnected. We live in a system of relationships. And living cooperatively in community over 3.85 billion years, all the while fostering abundance and richness. And if we look back at what we build and what we create as a species, can we point to all of that and say, we have enhanced, not just done less harm, but have we enhanced, regenerated, and created abundance in what we do? Because the beauty of it is entirely possible. We know it's possible. It's been going on for 10 months. It's been going on for 3.85 billion years. And ultimately, what life is doing is creating conditions conducive to life. And if you could put that phrase, and this is what we try to do in our work, put that phrase after every one of our actions, every one of our design projects, every one of our strategies, initiatives, whatever, we ask ourselves, does this create conditions conducive to life? And we should, as a species, I mean, we evolved these pretty darn big brains. We should be able to wholeheartedly say with a very large resounding yes. Yes, we can. Yes, we do. Because this is our home, right? This is our home, too. We are one of those 30 million species on this planet. But what we have to remember that while this is our home, it's not ours alone. It's not ours alone. And in remembering that we are a very young species, very, very young. We're toddlers, but we act like teenagers, right? Teenagers think they know it all, but they really don't. But we're toddlers. And so in doing so, we need to put ourselves in that mindset of what does it mean to be a toddler. So we're a very young species, but the reality is, is we have a very big impact. And you're all aware of the impact that we have as a species. And every day, the newspapers are reporting on more and more about what we do. But ultimately, my question is, as a species, are we fitting upon this earth 
are we fitting within this earth? And to me, I'll know that we've achieved sustainability when we're fitting within, right? We are part of this larger community. When Darwin said survival of the fittest, it was those that are most fitted, that fit in, right? It wasn't who can run the fastest away from the lion on your tail. So what does that mean to fit in? That's what I'm here to talk about. And so when we begin to ask that and some of the things that are happening, this is where this whole green building space comes up and all the things that we have to think about, water and materials and energy and efficiency and, and uh, carbon footprint and where we're getting our needs met, trying to weave this all into this, this crazy space. And, and there's a lot of things going on. And what you're working on in your world, in the built environment, it's just one of the many cries for help that are out there, right? We as a species are crying for help and other species are crying for help that are begging us to figure out how to get this to work because ultimately we have to ask ourselves, who's at risk here? Who's at risk? Is it us? Is it our children? Is it our children's children? Is it the other 30 million species? I would say it's all of it, because we are nature, right? We like to think of us humans and nature. I mean, th that phrase should never be used, because we are nature. We're homo sapiens sapiens. Look at us. There's nothing square and linear and angular and rigid and fixed about us, even though that's the way our buildings are. We are part of that system. We've evolved just like they have. And as a result, what we make and what we do is natural. I will argue vehemently that my computer is natural, that this building is natural, that the chemicals in this dyed black jacket are natural because they are an extension of me being part of nature. But the difference between the way this jacket is made and the way the melanin of a black beetle is made is the difference between two different kinds of strategies. Those strategies may both be natural, but one of them is maladapted, all right? And so if you look at a lot of what humans do, we can collectively look at those, call them natural, but they're maladapted strategies. And really what we ultimately must move ourselves towards is a place in which our strategies are well adapted. And that's the beauty of knowing that we have 30 million other organisms and species and ideas and concepts and strategies that we can draw upon to learn what does it mean to be well adapted. We don't have to make this up. Isn't that a relief? Isn't that a huge relief? So if we know we have to get from maladapted to well adapted, right? that's, that's, that's the, that is the agenda for your work, for my work, for everybody's work, is how do you get from there to here? And naturally, we end up with some incremental approaches. So we start in the built environment, energy star, healthy buildings, and we got into lead silver and lead gold and lead platinum, the net zero carbon, net zero energy, the living buildings, regenerative design, just biomimicry, these are all steps that are moving us towards looking, acting, behaving, functioning a lot more like the rest of life, the way the other organisms have fine-tuned and learned to thrive on this planet. We need to get there as fast as we possibly can, right? We know that's where we need to go. And there probably isn't a single person who will say, no, well, that's actually not the direction we need to go. That's where we need to go. The challenge, of course, is this is the path we've taken to get there. And if you think about how much energy that we're putting into all of these different steps, and granted, it's part of being a new, a new toddler, right? What's, what's with that whole crawling thing? What a waste of time. Why don't we just walk? Well, building the crawling is building, actually laying the neurons in your brain that does the cross body function. And if you didn't crawl, your brain wouldn't develop that way. So we have to go through these incremental steps. But I encourage all of you to not begin to believe that's all you need to do. 
that every project should be stretching and stretching and stretching. Recognizing we've got to learn this, we've got to figure this out, we've got to make mistakes and learn from them, but stretch. And stretch to go towards what we know works and we know has worked for 3.85 billion years. So imagine then if we ask the question, how to do it, right? How has life not just survived on this planet, but thrived, right? Gone from these simple single-celled organisms, well, simple may be degradatory, but they've evolved, right, into what we consider this amazing, complex, abundant world. How have they done it? And you ask the question, how does life manage water? And you learn these amazing, amazing secrets that can really provide insight into how you might manage water in your own project, whether it's the redwood pumping water against gravity 300 feet up into the canopy using sunlight only, or the tick that is able to pull water out of air that's only 40% humidity, enough water to sustain itself, or the tank bromeliad that in capturing and harvesting water provide thriving ecosystems that support dozens and dozens and dozens of species in a jungle canopy. Or this was an ant mound I took a picture of in India where it's a monsoon and it floods. And this was their really cool ant created this to drain out so that they didn't flood their colony. And what would it look like if we created drainage pathways that dealt with rain by learning from ants? How does life manage temperature? How do the caribou keep their feet from freezing? Wouldn't we like to figure that out? You guys get as cold here as we do in Montana. How do you keep those appendages, whether it's building appendages sticking out or our own appendages? It actually is a countercurrent heat exchange. What about changing our facades? What if we change the color of them so that during the summer, they're not absorbing heat during the winter. They are absorbing solar heat, secrets from the chameleon. Or thinking about how buildings interact. A lot of plants in the desert borrow shade from other plants. Could our buildings really rely and borrow shade from others as part of our integrated strategy? How does life optimize the gathering and use of materials? Whether we talk about this really cool paper that comes in wasp nests, saliva and cellulose that's assembled. It's really water resistant. It's really amazing, amazing compound. Or burrowing owls, they actually go around and they collect the feces of other organisms. And, and so they take waste, they line their burrows with it, and the dung beetles come to come haul away the, the feces, and then they pick off and eat the dung beetles. Right? So innovative ways to think about using others' waste to maybe get what you really want get the raw materials that you're looking for. This um, bottom thing is a, a Venus flower basket. It is a glass bee sponge that when shown to some high-rise architects, recognized all of the seven principles critical to building in terms of design. But these supports, these supports, these supports the wraparound supports. The whole thing was playing out in a sponge, which isn't even a single organism. It's a colony of organisms that have captured what it took high-rise engineers dozens, if not hundreds of years, to perfect. Or plants, right? They're turning CO2, gas, into plastic, essentially, right? Long-chain hydrocarbons is what we make our plastic out of. That's what a plant is doing. It's assembling CO2 into hydrocarbons. How does life optimize rather than maximize? It lives in this world of limits and boundaries. You've got to be pretty clever. It does things like uses multifunctional design. That duck is grooming. That's one functional need. In grooming, it's smoothing out and maintaining the life of its feathers. But it actually gathers some oil from the base of its tail feathers, and that oil also waterproofs. So now we've got smooth feathers that are waterproof, right? which is kind of nice. But it turns out that while you're waterproofing your feathers, you're also really doing a great moisturizer for your beak, which
which is pretty important because when a beak dries out, it'll crack. You don't want to be a duck with a cracked beak. So now you've got a third function. You've got your beak moisturized, but then the duck goes one step further because that oil, in the presence of sunlight, turns into vitamin D. So it gets its vitamin dose every morning as well as it grew. All right. Four functions met with a single action, a single strategy. We're more of the, like, one, you know, one function per strategy if we're lucky. Or leveraging the interdependence. This sea slug has algae that live in its back, and it borrows the sugars, and in exchange, it gives food. So how can we harness the energy from our residents of our buildings? What does that look like? How can we build that into our building models? And how do we plan for growth? How do we put infrastructure in place like a fern as it unfurls, that accommodates and recognizes change, and that growth will happen? And really the question, how does life create abundant and thriving places to live? All of these species here are considered ecosystem engineers. Despite their size, they have huge impacts on the ecosystem. And if it weren't for them, those ecosystems wouldn't exist. Well, we're an ecosystem engineer as well. And what does it look like to actually increase species diversity because of our presence, as opposed to decrease it? Right? at all kingdoms, not just the bacterial increase, which we're very good at that one. Well, to do all of this, to be willing to ask that question, we have to quiet our cleverness. We have to go back into the minds of our children, this is my daughter, and ask those questions because they love learning. They're really saying, our children are saying to us, Mama, Papa, how do I learn to live here on this planet? That's what all their questions are about. But we as adults, if you ask that question, people would kind of look at you funny. Instead, you're supposed to know. You're rewarded for what you already know, rather than what you're being willing to ask. So if we can find that childlike mind, quiet our cleverness, our convincing that we know it already, then we can begin to move forward and move into the space and practice in biomimicry what we call the conscious emulation of nature's those four words are pretty carefully chosen, right? Conscious implies intent, that we actually decided there's some wisdom there that we could go out and learn from. Emulation is also a pretty important word because emulation is not copying. We're not talking about taking that dragonfly wing, putting it on a photocopier, and doing exactly the same thing. The laws of physics won't allow us, right? There are some limitations to this. But could we pull some of the deep design principles? And one of the things I told my son when we were talking about the flight is that if you look at big soaring animals, or birds, they actually have flipped up wingtips on the end, vultures and eagles, and those give them greater lift so they don't have to work so hard. They actually don't have to flap to soar. The larger you get if you have that extra lift. So as we get into airplanes now, engineers in the last 10 years have figured out the flipped up wing tip thing. But imagine if they had asked 50 years ago and started building that. And that's a deep design principle, right? We're not saying put feathers on wings of airplanes. We're saying the last 12% flip up at a 38 degree angle or whatever it is, and you'll get greater lift. So that's the idea behind emulation. Nature's genius is based on the premise that, well, yeah, she's been around a little bit longer than we have, and therefore she's probably figured out a thing or two in that time that we could gather some wisdom from. So we look to nature as a model, as a measure, and a mentor. Right? And it's really a different way of valuing the natural world. The entire Industrial Revolution was based on what we could take and what we could extract. We'll take the wood and the coal and the water and the bioproducts, what does it mean if we say, hey, excuse me, may we borrow your recipe? What is the elegant way in which you've assembled your fly parts to make fibers, rather than farming spiders to make those fibers for us? It's a very different way of valuing the other species that live on this planet. And biomimicry tries to get at that deep level of pulling ideas, using nature's wisdom to tell us, is this going to fit? Is this appropriate? Is this well adapted? And then when we begin to look at nature in a different way, we think of her as a mentor 
rather than just a resource provider. Now, we call this an emerging discipline, but it's based in a very ancient practice. As a species, we've always looked to nature for ideas. But we remembered to do so when we were surrounded by nature. Now we've surrounded ourselves by glass and steel and concrete, and we forget to go ask. The Inuit people learned from the polar bears how to build igloos, how to structure the snow based on what they'd learned from polar bear dens. The early peoples in the San Luis Valley studied the ground squirrel and how deep they built their bedroom chambers out of soil and mud. And when they built their adobe, they made the walls the same thickness so that they'd get the same thermal properties that the ground squirrel had discovered. So it's really a, a remembering rather than a new practice for us as a species. And there's lots of different ways in which people are doing this. They might be mimicking form, mimicking process, and mimicking ecosystems. I'm going to give you a few examples here. Learning from termite mounds about temperature management. This is a building in Harare, Zimbabwe, that has no HVAC system, but it's near the equator. It stays a constant 24 degrees Celsius, about 74 degrees Fahrenheit, using the principles of the termite mound. The Swiss rebuilding in London designed its passive ventilation system based on the passive flow that goes through soft sponges. And the polar bear was an inspiration for the Singapore Arts Center about the polar bear hairs standing on end, allowing light into the skin to warm up the polar bear, and then laying back down to capture that air. And the Singapore Arts Center has all of these louvers that have photo cells on them and can respond to the light as it Here's some of the building examples. There's a bunch that's happening in the built environment as well. Swarm theory is actually very interesting. How do schools of fish swarm and, and birds flock? And they're using it to optimize energy flows and the principles and the simple rules around swarm theory. So there's a company called uh, Regen Energy that's got a whole swarm logic controller so you don't have um, peak basically managing the whole peak loads and peak demands um, based on this, these concepts around swarm theory. They're out of Canada. A lot of really cool stuff is happening uh, with solar and how we can learn from different parts of the solar uh, world. One of the ones that, that's getting a lot of traction lately is the dye-sensitized solar cells, probably the closest thing we're getting towards um, photosynthesis, which is really a pigment-based uh, accumulation of energy. And there's a couple of other great things that are happening in that solar world. And then even how we use energy and how efficient we are when we use energy. This owl feather and the fringe of an owl feather is what keeps an owl so quiet. Well, one of the reasons it's quiet, it has less drag. And if we can move things with less drag, it means less friction, it means less energy consumption. So this is a fan by a company in Germany called the Owlet. By just putting those fringes, they found that their fans were much quieter, but also much more energy efficient. So lots of potential places in the product world for energy. So region energy, Dysol is doing a lot of the dye sensitized solar cells and Bill Abeg. Of course, concrete is a really important building material we use a lot of. The um, rhino horn is a self-healing horn. Right? It's not living material, but it's self-healing. So if we think about a lot of the reasons we dismantle buildings and bridges and other structures is there's so many micro cracks in them that they have structural potential structural failure. So what if our concrete self-healed? And there's a, um, some folks that have worked on that looking at the way the rhino horn works in order to build self-healing and crack-resistant concrete. Concrete, of course, in its production uses a lot of carbon dioxide. And so recently in the press, actually even Tom Friedman was writing about it, there's a company called Calera that has learned how to actually sequester more CO2 than it's producing in using low temperature kilns, very much similar to the way life biomineralizes in a coral reef in order to create, uh, to create concrete, significantly reducing what's coming out of those flue gases. Also from the sea, if we think about other great places we could use wisdom, is blue mussels. And blue mussels adhere to rocks. 
That's a glue that cures underwater, non-toxic, amazing, flexible glue. Well, some scientists worked on that, and they developed a glue called Pure Bond, which is going into Columbia Forest products, all of their sheet goods, their plywood, their OSB, their um, particle boards. It replaces the urea formaldehyde-based glues, and you no longer have the off-gassing issues around those, those sheet materials. A glue inspired by the muscles, not using muscles, but inspired by the muscles. Um, and Pure Bond is the product. So Natural Process Design is the company doing the concrete. Calera is also doing concrete. And Columbia Forest Products is using Pure Bond. Of course, there's a lot of chemicals in the built environment that are pretty scary. Brominated flame retardants being one of those. There's not a human on the planet that doesn't have those in their bodies, unfortunately. So alternatives to um, those sort of toxic flame retardants are, are in much demand. There's a company out of Sweden right now called MHE Technologies that has used citrus and is actually mimicking the Krebs cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle, which the Krebs cycle, if you remember way back to high school biology, takes heat, releases water. That's what happens if you simple it down to its very simple components. Well, wouldn't that make a great fire extinguisher, right? Take heat, release water. And so they've actually developed a compound that can be both sprayed on and embedded that's based off of citric. Uh, some of you might be familiar with um, the flooring that's come out of Interface. That was a project we worked with them on many, many years ago, learning from a forest floor and how nature would design a floor. Really cool uh, product line has come out of that, reduces waste, reduces um, both in production and installation and reuse. Um, by having a randomized but connected pattern on the floor, and they've integrated a whole benign manufacturing process into that whole piece of it. And then that beautiful lotus I told you about before, rising up out of the muck, but yet staying so clean, self-cleaning technologies based on what's called the lotus effect, popping up everywhere, starts with paint facade. There's over 300,000 buildings in Europe that have been painted with this. When it rains, it washes clean. No detergent necessary, you no know, getting up there and scrubbing. Uh, they're applying it to glass, they're applying it to roofing tiles, applying it to children's clothing, <laughs> you name it, to get that dirt off with just adding, uh, adding water. So MHE Technologies out of Sweden, Interface is based out of Atlanta, and Stowe is the company that's making Lotus on right now. And even at the systems level, there's quite a bit we can learn. You guys are probably all familiar because up here in your neck of the woods, you have John Todd and his work about emulating estuaries and how estuaries carefully weave systems together. Um, and when, in, in weaving those systems and learning how the, all multiple kingdoms cycle and, 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 and clean waste, estuaries are nature's way of cleaning water. And so he's developed the ecological machines. Down in Australia, a person has um, mimicked this, the riparian soil and how that gets cleaned and is making home septic tanks based on how the riparian zone also cleans water. Uh, those are called biopods. So John Todd, Ecological Design, is doing that. And then Biolytics is the company in Australia that's making the septic tanks that follow that. So I, I probably have a database of 150 different products and ideas that are relevant for the built environment. Of course picking and choosing what to share. But this gives you just a sampling of some of what are called enabling technologies, all right, to make this happen. But what's important is that all of you, while you may be able to go buy some of it that's off the shelf, there's a lot that you can also do yourself just by going for a walk in the woods. Some of it is beginning to think about how do we measure, right? How do we, how do we use nature as a measure to help us best understand? We have a project and an initiative we're calling Ecological Performance Standards. And in its essence, it says, should not our built in environment perform at the same level as the environment in which we're displacing to put it in there, right? Should we not be fixing the same amount of CO2 as that environment that was displaced? Should we not be storing as much fresh water, producing as much biomass, building as much soil, producing O2, evaporating as much water, whatever it might be, and different habitats require different parameters. But wouldn't that be the ultimate performance standard? Is that we are functioning like the ecosystem in which we reside. 
right? We are truly actually sitting in. One of the places we've done this is a project in India where in that particular moist deciduous forest, 70% of the rainfall goes back down into the groundwater, right? That was one of the things the ecology of that place told us. So we took that to the developers and the architects and the planners and said, you need to plan that 70% of the rainwater goes back down into the ground. And then they use that as a design parameter, whether it's permeable pavers or how they get the water off the roof, 20% gets evaporated back to the air. And if it doesn't, then inland gets dry. So now they're looking at ways that they can pull building rooftops that will actually encourage that evaporation, right? so that they follow those same sets of parameters. Those are ecological performance standards. Nature is mentor, going out, going for a walk, understanding what is happening here, how can I learn from this place. We do things called survive and thrive, right? Little, what are the ecological realities of this place and how has life learned to deal with them? What is the genius of this place and, and how does that manifest? Here's a quick example, taking an architect from HOK into a desert and explaining to him how the barrel cactus has a really great way of self-shading. Those pleats are designed to make sure that you don't have so much surface area in direct view of the sun all the time. Pretty important in the desert where it's hot. But then we also explained that the density of the stomata, which is where the plant gets in carbon dioxide but also loses water, changes so that on the outside margins there aren't very many stomata and deep within the pleats there are more stomata so that it reduces the amount of water loss. So he was so inspired by this that he designed a self-shading high rise but more importantly on the left that's the relative size of the windows. So on the outside ridges the windows are smaller and deep within the pleats the windows are bigger so that you can manage the heat gain. This was for a project in um, in the Middle East that he was working on. So a very, very simple design concept that can be turned into an emulated pattern from that genius of that place. So really, it's about learning to fit in again. Again, we did fit in, and we still can fit in. So how do we learn to fit in again? by creating conditions conducive to life. As I mentioned earlier, this is how we approach our work. This is how we think about what we do. We have two organizations. We have a consulting firm. We have a nonprofit. We have a whole bunch of initiatives that um, are designed to foster that approach in everything that we do. Um, two I want to tell you specifically about. One is called Innovation for Conservation, which is basically a royalties for habitat. If you're going to design a product, you're going to learn how the gecko sticks to walls and design a, a tape, gecko tape, and make millions off of it. Shouldn't you actually be paying the original patent holder, the gecko, right? And so what we do is protect the habitat of the gecko, is to turn that money back into ground dollars for conservation for the gecko, because really it's the critical Thanksgiving piece that's so important in this. Another thing, if you haven't been there already, I highly encourage you to go is Ask Nature, where you really can type in the question, how does nature manage temperature? And you'll get a whole bunch of really great examples. And there's a whole lot of ways to connect with others and to learn some of the magic secrets that nature has to offer. We have about 1,200 strategies in there right now. It's only a small fraction, of course, of what we already know and have yet to put in. But it's a growing, growing community and space. And the beauty of all of this is that, fortunately, we are surrounded by genius. We are not alone in this. And the way to begin to go about doing this, right? we're inside right now. We're stuck here. We're talking with each other, one brain to another brain. But really, the best ideas are out there. So go outside. Okay? <laughs> Step number one, and thankfully for you guys, more so than in other places where I talk, it is right outside your door. Mexico City, it takes an hour of driving to get to nature. Yours is right outside your door. But when you're there, it's not necessarily just hop on that mountain bike and whip through the landscape. Breathe. Slow down. Right? Spend some time. 
and take off the hat that says, I know, and put on the hat that says, what's going on? That asks the question, that listens. That listens to what that incredible wisdom has to tell us. And only then, after we have listened, can we echo back. Because that's what we need to do to really fit in. So what world will you design now? What world will you create now? Now that you know that wisdom is there. Because this world is our home. Thank you. have time for Q&A in the schedule, so what I'd like to offer to you is that during the break that's at 2, from 2 to 2.20, that I'll be out at the, what do they call the top of the hop or whatever over there in that space if anybody would like to come up and I can answer some questions at that time, but thank you very much for sharing your time with me today. Thank you.